Hi, everyone. Welcome to Hot Seat with Cognizant Clay. I am your host, Clayton Terrio. Today on the show, we have Al at Mansky. Al is a community organizer and an activist for people with disabilities. He has received the Order of Canada for his strenuous work to provide a better life for people with disabilities. I hope you guys enjoy it. Well, how are you doing today? How, how is everything going with you? Everything's going uh, pretty well. We had a sunny day here in uh, in the west coast for a change and uh, so I managed to sneak out in between meetings for a quick uh, bit of exercise outdoors and where I could breathe some fresh air. It's definitely a nice change this last uh, I guess 11 months now has been quite the the uh, groundbreaking story but so just to get into your story, because we've all had enough of COVID, um, you you have quite the resume and it was it was hard to differentiate what questions I wanted to ask. First, I will start with why you became an advocate for the disabled community. And that was because of your daughter, Liz, who was born with Down syndrome. And what was it like for you and your wife when you got the diagnosis? Um. Well, it happened right away. Uh, and so right away, the doctors indicated that something was wrong, which they were wrong about. But, you know, immediately it set off all of that alarm. And then um, when they finally explained what they meant uh, a few hours later, it was uh, a mystery uh, because we had no idea. We, we, we didn't know much about disability other than, you know, what you picked up at the time. Uh, we knew a few people with disabilities, but you know, this was, it was a, it was a mystery and, and we were very, very curious about it. So uh, what I remember about it was feeling overwhelmed um, feeling curious and feeling angry at the way um, the way we were treated, um, the way they described, the way they set up our daughter that way. Um, um, I only mention that because I don't think that anger left me for decades, for a long time. Uh, and, you know, I don't blame the doctor. I don't blame the textbooks that we searched through to find out a little bit more what it meant. Um, but I blame a system that contrived something that, that attempted to separate me from my, my daughter. Definitely. And I think society obviously has gotten better since then, but I still think there is miles and miles to to go still to fully kind of I guess encapsulate what it's like to be disabled it's it's still like we're almost outsiders and and that is sad but I am grateful that it is getting better and when did it sort of click in your mind that you wanted to become an advocate for the disability community um well thank you for that question um I'm my trade or my profession, it's not really a profession though, is community organizing. So before my daughter was born, I was, you know, I was kind of a grassroots activist, um, working in community on poverty issues, um, issues of race, um, issues of housing, inequity, um, stereotypes toward older people, you know, those kinds of things. And so it was a pretty natural progression to transfer my community organizing background into the disability world as I began to realize what was not out there. And so I see Liz was born, I was trying to think within, I would say within a year, I was an active volunteer and within two and a half years, um, I was a full-time activist. Um, 
I was actually hired, uh, Clayton, to run the, I want to be careful about when I say this name, but the BC Association for the, and we don't use that word anymore, but that's how long ago it was, the R word. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so they hired me as the executive director to close the three big institutions in British Columbia, to close the segregated schools, uh, to integrate the classrooms, and to change uh, programs they called the achievement centers, which were places where people just were bored all day to actual work. So that was sort of my job, which is right up, right up my alley as a community organizer. Definitely, and that's that's a fascinating story. Thanks for sharing that. And and obviously, being a parent of a disabled child, what what were some of the lessons, or are some of the lessons that you've learned from Liz over her lifetime? Oh, oh, well, that it did keep it keeps coming. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, all of our children have a lot to teach us. Um, and and that's kind of a platitude but 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 it's true as well they lead us into territory we didn't imagine usually kicking and screaming and protesting <laughs> uh, because we think we know best but uh so um liz taught me you know taught me many many things i think um you know, I want to be careful, you know, when I talk about it this way, because I don't want her to be seen as my inspiration or my savior, but I hate to think about the kind of person I would have become if I had not encountered the world of disability. Um, and that's the world that Liz led me into. Um, I think I would have been arrogant. Uh, I think I would have or more arrogant maybe <laughs> than I am. And I think I would have pushed my beliefs on people about what was best for them. And I tried to do that with Liz. You know, I tried to, I tried to make her fit in, risking extinguishing who she really was because I thought that would lessen her you know, whatever challenges she would personally face. So I learned, I learned not to do that. And I learned that her spirit and her fire <laughs> and her passion was stronger than my attempt to get her to conform. There's many more lessons, but I don't know. What, what do you think about that one? Is that, is that one? I think that's, I think that's a great answer. I, I think that's, very opposite of cliche, which is, is definitely something that I want on my podcast, but I find, and I'm sure you agree with this, but I'm not going to speak for you either, is people with Down syndrome are the sweetest, most caring people you will ever meet. It's like they don't have a hateful bone in their body. And it's, it's, I think, I think Down syndrome is one of the more teachable disabilities there are, at least in my opinion, with my experience. I might reframe that as, um, as that, is that they, you know, I, I've seen Liz's capacity for peacemaking. So it's not that she does not, uh, emotionally react to the the insults and the and the slurs and the teasing and the and the bullying and it's not that she you know can't get angry about that is that she's always searching for a way to resolve something in a peaceful way um i think people with down sy system syndrome have drive determination, a healthy ego, and a desire to make a difference. And sometimes this image of them uh, as being 
lovable actually prevents that from help from prevents them from realizing their their own version of what a good life is because they they're assigned that role by society. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I so I, I'd like us to get behind that. You know, people with Down syndrome, like all people with disabilities, are are not reading the rule book anymore. Right? And I like to think that Liz's life has been defined by the fact that she refused to read the rule book or to pay attention to any of the rules including society's views of, or typecasting and those kinds of things. So, um, I mean, people with Down syndrome are fashion models, they're politicians, they're TV stars. I could go on and on and on, artists, musicians, etc. cetera. So, uh, and essentially that's, Liz is a spoken word poet, a graphic artist, um and um and 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 generally a, an artist um uh, so she does graphic facilitation but then she has her own art practice in oils and watercolors and she does electronic she she has an electronic ipad that allows her to in, in effect uh create a a palette and 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 paint on screen um so she does all of that and she takes her work very very seriously i think she works at it she spent the last nine months with us during COVID, and um, and she works her art twenty four seven. She's always on. That's awesome. That's great to hear. And yeah, you you mentioned all those all those like I guess jobs, but or careers. But there's I don't know if you've heard of Amy Bockerstedt. She's an American with Down syndrome, and she is the first ever athlete to get a scholarship with down syndrome and it's just everyone's like oh she's so inspiring but it's like they don't want to be inspiring they just want to do their own thing like people should be inspiring for what they do not what they overcome Mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people think oh just because you're disabled you're inspiring and I just think that's plain wrong that's not you're not giving like you said before you're not giving us the the I guess the satisfaction of doing something it's just, oh, you're inspiring because you're disabled. There, there's nothing inspiring about doing a mundane task. Absolutely not. But I've gotten it my whole life and I've learned to just, you know, correct it and tell people like, I appreciate it, but I'm not inspiring just because I'm in a wheelchair. That's not, it's only a part of me. It's not who I am or who I identify as. And I think that's really important. And so I really wanted to touch on this. This is so plan the plan lifetime advocacy network. And that was co-founded by you and your wife, Vicki. And I'm just going to read the notes here. So I get it right. Cause I don't want to get it wrong. It helps to set up and nurture long-term support networks for individuals for with disabilities, which I think is phenomenal. And, and how, how did that come about founding plan? Well, um, so this is, probably close to a 40 year journey now. <laughs> so <laughs> way before you were born, um, we were approached by some older parents. Uh, I thought they were really old, uh, Clayton or Clay. Do I call you Clayton or Clay? Doesn't matter. Either way. Okay. What, what do you prefer? Do you have a preference or? No, not really. Okay. Uh, anyway, they came up to me at a Christmas party um, and I, for the this provincial association for community living as it's now called that i was the executive director of and they said you know young fellow it's good for you for being part of closing institutions and segregated schools and all that you're doing a great job but when are you gonna when are you gonna help us and i had trouble imagining that i hadn't covered everything i was young and full of myself (laughs) i said what do you mean thinking, how could I have overlooked something? Uh, It mustn't be that important. And they said, you know, we know something that you don't know uh, yet, which is we're going to die sooner rather than later. And when we look out there, those programs and services that are out there for our sons and daughters, they're not enough. We do not have peace of mind. And that led me on a journey to discover uh, what peace of mind meant for parents and what and the, the other half of that is what a good life means for the, the son or daughter or the family member, uh, Clayton. 
And, and so we thought we'd start a little pilot project on the West Coast here in Vancouver for 75 people and we'd be, you know, we'd be done with it. That would be it. And we encountered a, I call it a demographic tsunami. It was really the first time in history that a whole generation of people with disabilities were outliving their parents. I mean, of course it happened before, but not with this magnitude. And the institutions in society and the nonprofits were not ready for it. They weren't even thinking about it. So we created the organization and people found out about it and, and they asked if they could create their own. We're now in over 40 locations around the world. And you're right, the, the basic service we offer is, um, there's many parts of it, but one is we address social isolation through a circle of friends. And the other bit though we do is we address poverty. So in effect, we had to rethink what the system was calling disability and say, well, the two biggest handicaps people with disabilities face, as far as we can see, are financial poverty and social isolation. So we did something about that. And, and both of those led us to really ramp up and in a big way, and maybe we can talk about it if you want, but that's when we got the idea for a registered disability savings plan to address poverty and stuff. So, Yeah, and, and there is a question about that coming, but I just wanted to touch on who are some of the co, like the main players alongside you and your wife in kind of, well, I guess the start of the 40 year junior, but who were some of the key players that helped out with that? Good question. <clears throat> uh, there was about uh, a dozen parents who came on board and they were risk takers. Uh, and they were risk takers because they had to be, because their sons and daughters were in their 30s, 40s and 50s. And, uh, and so the parents knew that what they had in place wasn't enough. So they really became problem solvers with us. Um, I can mention a couple of names. Jack Collins was the founding president and we consider him to be the real founder. Um, he, he was incredible. I don't know if he talked to 10,000 people in, you know, in one year, or, you know, 100,000 families in 10 years, or, you know, he, he was full-time volunteering, looking at wills and estate planning, and all of the barriers that existed with government benefits, and uh, worked to create changes, and uh, was tireless in teaching parents how to put together a will and estate plan with a good trust for their family member with a disability. He was amazing. Joan Lawrence was another remarkable mother. She wouldn't let me get away with anything. So I became the executive director <laughs> of this place. And we had a great relationship and it was based on trust, but she had an eagle eye on everything. It was really a good combination of you know, families taking charge. Um, those are the two that come to my mind. I could, I could go on, but um, I'll stop there. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's good to hear that, you know, well, and the mother, motherly instinct is so on the ball. Like, like you say, the eagle eye, they, they know things you don't like without women. I don't know where we would be. My, my mother is my number one favorite person in my life. And she's just always on the ball. She, she knows me better than I know myself, which is a scary thought, but it's, it's true. It really is. And, and you mentioned RDSP and that's the registered disability savings plan, which is absolutely groundbreaking in my opinion. And, and was that passed in 2008? Is that correct? Yep. yep. Okay. And so if you could just give a brief description of what it is to viewers who might not know, and then also just what the process was like in getting that done. Um, well, the brief description is that the government will match 
um, contributions from the individual with a disability, their family, friends, or somebody in the community. Um, they'll match it on a declining scale of three to one, two to one, one to one. So uh, a, a contribution of a hundred dollars becomes 400 because it's matched three to one. So the $300 is the match and along with the one it's $400. Um, and it has on top of that, it has a, a grant, uh, sorry, um, um, the, the grant is the three to one matching and then it has a bond of $1,000 a year for 20 years. Um, uh, and you don't have to make a contribution to that. And you know it has a certain income limit to it. So it might be less than a thousand, but that's the rough, rough arrangements. And the money that government puts in to matching or, or via the bond has to stay in for 10 years. That was kind of a kicker that we had to accept in order to get this. Um, but when it's in there for 10 years, it multiplies, it gets compound interest. So that, so the, the money really builds up. And um, the other component is that you can have money in your disability savings plan and it doesn't count as an asset for provincial disability benefits. And when you take the money out of the disability savings plan, it can't, it won't be clawed back. So we, we, we had to work with all provinces in the territories to get them to waive their asset limits and to eliminate clawback. So that's, the, that's it basically. There's some a lot of great websites out there. Plan has a great RDSP website. Uh, it can give you ideas if you put in $500 a year, how it can multiply, how it's matched, what the bond is, all that stuff. You, or you put in $75, $75 or $1,000, it'll tell you how it plays out over, over the years. The campaign was over 10 years though. So that's the other part of it. In order to get okay. that, we worked we work with three different prime prime ministers uh, before we got it, and uh, and the third prime minister was Harper, um, and his minister of finance was Jim Flaherty, and he had um, uh, two sons with disabilities, so he got it, he got it, and he made it happen. He made it happen like real fast, Clayton. It was awesome. amazing. Once he once he got it in his hands, uh, he just made it happen really fast. And so um, he's really, in many ways, the the godfather of all that. Combined nowadays, you know. So after that lobbying advocacy campaign of ten years, and then came into being in 08, as you said, 2008, and we're now 2018, that's 10 years, another three years, so we're 13 years into it. The combined deposits in the disability savings plan, the registered disability savings plans, uh, over 5 billion. Oh my, wow, that's, that's impressive. <laughs> yeah, and so people have, um, some individuals have now, I think it's in the neighborhood of $90,000 in their in their account. It's probably more than that. Sorry, I haven't caught up with it. Um, that they can use on what they want. Buy a house. Um, uh, new furnishings, go on a trip, spend it on additional education, et cetera. Um, and... Um, it won't be clawed back anyway, or put them offside any of the provincial benefits. Yeah, it's it's definitely a great program, and and we're in the process of getting me set up with that because that is just a phenomenal program. My one of my good friends that lives in the March of Dimes building that I live in, John, he bought an accessible van with his RDSP money, and he said it was just life changing. As soon as he was able to access the money, the van was the first thing he bought. And we're lucky enough to be rent geared to income with community living. So that's that's definitely a plus. And it's it is absolutely phenomenal that there's no clawback towards ODSP or any of the other provincial disability savings plans because 
there's so many restrictions for what you can and can't do if you don't have an RDSP. So mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely great to hear that it's implemented. And, and this next part, this is, this is going to be a little long winded question, but it's, it's tying all your books into one question. So I don't have to take <laughs> an hour on each book, but so you're the author of four books, three of which are geared for disabled, the disabled population. And that's the power of disability impact safe and secure and a good life. I'm not sure which one doesn't belong, but it doesn't matter. Um, and so a good life is essentially a guide to planning for the future. If you have a disability, safe and secure is a seven step and they're all just basically guides for living a better life with a disability. And what do, first of all, just to explain the three books, like what, what do they have in common? Well, actually, the thread that runs through them all is, um, is the power of people with disabilities. Um, so, for example, you mentioned the book Impact. Um, so that's a book about how to make uh, social change at a big level, at, a, at scale, system changing scale. And um, the backstory is the, the story of how we got the RDSP and how we got some of the other things associated um, with our work at PLAN. So it has 50 stories of Canadians who have managed to achieve big impact change on all matters, you name it, climate change, environmental issues, poverty, homelessness, dealing with people who drink and drive, et cetera, et cetera, the whole kit and caboodle. So that's what it's about. But the underlying story is uh, the ingenuity and the creativity of people with disabilities. So it's there, even though it's a book about social change. Um, the first two books, Safe and Secure and A Good Life, that was designed for families uh, around the world who want to leave in place plans for their son or daughter to enjoy a good life. And so we have, I have, I think, 17 editions of my first book and many of the second one. Uh, so we give the rights away to groups in Brazil, Japan, Poland, Holland, Australia, across Canada. There's an edition in Ontario. There's two, it's been done, redone twice, I think, and they're doing a third version. There's an indigenous edition being worked on, et cetera. So those are out there, but the book I'm, you know, that really kind of combines all of them is, uh, is, the, is my current book, which is The Power of Disability, because in many ways, it's not actually a book about disability. It's a book for individuals, families, nonprofits, businesses and government who uh, want to learn how to survive, thrive and change the world. And I just pulled the sources on how to do that from the world of disability. So it's actually a book about social change too. It just happens to be using examples of people from the world of disability to demonstrate that we would not recognize the world today if you removed the contributions of people with disabilities. Awesome. That's a, and that's exactly what I think the disabled community needs is, is like you say, it's, if we've been overlooked for so long, give us a chance. And I, I don't know if you know Caroline Casey, the disability advocate from Ireland. I've had her on my show and it was just, she blows my mind every time I listen to her. It's just <laughs> fascinating her her whole backstory and everything is just crazy and it's it's <laughs> just you almost don't believe it it sounds like fiction but so many people with disabilities do like it's you could name so many people Stephen Hawking another one I've always looked up to and may he rest in peace but man what a what a what a genius what a, what a great mind he had and it's just if you can look past the disability there's there's it's, there's more there than it appears. And I think it's it's a very beautiful thing. And where can, if my viewers are interested, where can we buy the books? 
Well, I think uh, the both impact and um, and the power of disability are available on any online, you know, place you buy books, Indigo chapters, et cetera, independent bookstores. Um, I've got a list of them all on my own website. And so I don't know if you can leave your viewers, listeners with, you know, the contact details for me uh, on my website, but that's another place um, where you can find out all of the sources of where the book is. Um, and um, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I'll link that in the description for sure. And I am going to do, so I do a, a section here called rapid fire where I just ask my guests various random questions and it's, it's one of my favorite parts of the show. So, and just to start off, since you are from BC, this this is a hard one for most people. Who is your favorite person from British Columbia? Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, other than family, it can be family. It can be either. It doesn't matter. I know it's a hard one. You don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> um. Well, I I would say. The name that comes to my mind is Chief Robert Joseph, who is a um, an elder in the in the indigenous community. Um, he has an organization that works on reconciliation. Um, he's a peacemaker. Um, he can bring people together who don't like each other bring people together who've hurt each other or don't trust each other. So, I mean, the thing about British Columbia is that our heritage is the same in, in Ontario. I, we don't pay enough and enough attention to what we have in this country and each province in terms of talent. Um, the thing about British Columbia is that the indigenous perspective has shaped how we see the world. It's in, it's in the art, you know, which captures the, the whiff, the smell of the ocean breeze and the, the outline of mountains and, and, uh, and the like. And uh, it has shaped how we do change here, um, how we approach social change. So he's the, he's, he came to my mind when you asked me. So there you go. <laughs> That's a great one. I like that. I, I like that. That's a great answer. And second question, what is your favorite thing to eat? I, I'm such a food oriented person that I always ask this. <laughs> Popcorn. <laughs> oh, wow. I, can eat, I like it. Uh, my kids, um, I, it can't be true. I, I have trouble believing that, but they, they all say uh, they're unanimous that I, I have served them popcorn for breakfast. That can't be true. Can it? I must have given them something else. I mean, you can get, you can eat anything you want for breakfast. It's, it doesn't matter as long as you're eating something, I guess. Um, and, and I don't know if you're a music guy, but I am. And who would be, you don't have to go top three, but three of your favorite musicians or bands. Well, I have to bring the boss in there, Bruce Springsteen. Uh, that's, that's kind of, I'm, um, uh, I'm an old timer, so I would put him in there. Um, I would put Van Morrison, although I don't like what he's talking about these days in terms of of um, being anti-mask and 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 the like. Um, but I I put him in there, and uh, so that's those are the international ones. It's a much harder to find somebody uh, in in Canada, um, I probably would go back to somebody um, like Gordon Lightfoot. Great, um, yes. Uh, now, if you asked me an hour from now, I'd be a little bit more quick-witted and I would probably bring in more women. Um, my musical tastes are quite wide, but those are the three that I can remember now. So. Uh, maybe that maybe you just got me a little nervous, so I can't I can't think more <laughs> more clearly about some of the other folks that I really enjoy listening to, like Joni Mitchell, for example. But even more contemporary 
uh, artists. So. No, those are good. Those are great. I like those. Um, and who, who would be, you can name a few, but, but just one, if you can keep it that way, but if, if you can't, don't worry, you can name a few, who are some disability advocates, fellow disability advocates that you look up to personally? Oh, well, that's, um, that's pretty easy. I mean, Catherine Frizee spends most of her time in Nova Scotia is phenomenal. Uh, Bonnie Cher Klein out here on the West Coast, remarkable book called uh, Slow Dance, the story of love, stroke and disability, filmmaker and whatever. Jane Sanders, playwright, um, an activist um, out here on the West Coast, Sam Sullivan, Stephanie Cadu, politicians, David Only in Ontario, remarkable um, Mayan Ziv, you know, um, just about your age, maybe a couple of years older in Ontario. I'm, I'm in awe of, have lots of respect and admiration for Carla Qualtro. I think she has uh, an incredible job to keep Canadians employed or to compensate them if they've lost their job and to advance a disability inclusion agenda. It's remarkable. I could go on. Yeah, yeah. This is... There's so many. There's so many. And then David Onley, you mentioned David Onley. He's been on my show. I actually met him at Queen's Park. Oh boy, 19. I was 19. 2011. I met him there and interviewed him there. And then on my podcast 10 years later. Um, and Rick Mercer has also been on my show. And he is such a good advocate for the disabled community. He's it's it's amazing what he's done with the Paralympics and everything. And and it's funny you mention uh, the 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 film the playwright there no the filmmaker sorry I actually watched Shameless the Power of Disability or the Art of Disability sorry this morning and uh -huh. it was it was a great film and I'm I'm currently taking a program called Accessible Media Production so it's focused on making media accessible and that was one of the movies that they recommended us watch mm -hmm. and it was just phenomenal and so anyway the last question. I love this one because th here's another one that you could name a million people. If you could be anyone living or dead for 24 hours, who would you be? <laughs> oh, hmm. Hmm, hmm. My goodness. If I could be anyone living or dead for 24 hours, um, huh? It's tough. I know it's, it's a hard one. I always yeah. I don't know. I'd be interesting. I, 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 which some of your other guests have said, people like Carolyn and whatever. My mind immediately goes to oh well. If I could have absolute power for 24 hours, then maybe I I should want to be the president of the United States. Um, on the other hand, social change happens from the ground up. And so somebody like Martin Luther King um, is a phenomenal, uh, you know, phenomenal peacemaker that I so, so, so admire uh, and still do. So I think I'd probably, I'd probably pick him um, as a, uh, as somebody who I, I would want to be. Yeah. yeah. That would be amazing. He would be, I've had all kinds. I've had all kinds. I've had Michelle Obama. I've had Muhammad Ali. I've had Wayne Gretzky. I've had so many different names. I can't think of, I'm on episode 40 right now. So it's, yeah. it's hard to, to kind of look back, but it's, there's definitely loads of people you can choose. Well, that's rapid fire. There you go. We're, we're all done. You're out of the woods for the, the nervous questions. Um, so just, just getting back to it a little bit. And, and this is, it's another thing that isn't directly related, but it pretty much everything you do is related to the disabled community. So Social Innovation Generation or SIG is another company you are the co-founder of. And can, can you just tell my viewers a little bit about what SIG is and what you guys do? Uh, it's what we did. It doesn't exist anymore. And it was a bunch okay. of us. It was a bunch of us from across the country who felt 
that um, the, 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 that we needed more emphasis on innovation to address issues of justice. And so it was called social innovation. It's kind of a buzz phrase, but it was just to identify for funders and for policymakers and for nonprofits that it was okay to be more inventive and ingenious and innovative. And there were four partners for this, uh, Clayton. Um, Mars Discovery District in downtown Toronto, a great big foundation in Montreal called the McConnell Foundation, University of Waterloo, and, and ourselves at Plan. So I called ourselves the, the three elephants in a mouse, and Plan was the Plan was the mouse. And what we wanted to do was sprinkle concepts of innovation, social innovation, so that the world would become more just or Canada would become more just. Um, it needed to end. Um, there's enough. We did enough, I think, to get kickstart more funding and more emphasis and link people up. But I want to say that all of the things we learned there were applying now a bunch of us across the country to um, create a Canadian disability benefit for that would see an income top up for every person with a disability in Canada who needs it, who's currently, currently receiving some form of disability benefit at a provincial or territorial level. And we've decided to, in effect, take over the whole process, even though we're not in charge, we decided to act as if we were in charge. And so we're doing everything we can from designing the benefit to doing public opinion polling, to hiring disabled people as campaign organizers, to bring in disabled artists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, um, so that period called social innovation generation was very helpful for my own thinking, but also for a lot of funders who have come in and they're backing this. This is, we, we have now a container that is um, grassroots based cross-disability led and independently financed so that it's not beholden to government. So, uh, and so we're, we're, we're wanting to solve poverty as experienced by people with disabilities. Awesome. Awesome to hear. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't know it was not a thing anymore, but it's, it's definitely a very interesting tidbit there. And, and the, this is, this is the main one of the coolest things and I've actually had the honor of having guests with this honor and that's the Order of Canada and that is I'm sure an honor to you I, I could not imagine what just as a general what what was it like receiving the Order of Canada I'm sure it was crazy <laughs> yeah I mean it came out of the blue <clears throat> we, we had no idea um so it, it was pretty cool, uh, for sure. And um, my wife and I got it together. So that was pretty cool. You know, to love your work and to love your partner in work. Uh, I wish that on everybody. <laughs> um, because it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing. And um, so we got to experience it together. And um, yeah, it was very personally personally, um, you know, kind of next to my children, you know, the nicest things that ever happened to me. Absolutely. And what, what, like, what a beautiful award and, and who, who were some of the other people that got it when you and your wife were awarded it? Oh my goodness. Uh, I was in 2015. Um, I can't think of his name now. He's an uh, iconic filmmaker, international director. Um, he got it. Oh, I, I, you know what? I can't remember uh, who, who they all were. We were all together <laughs> in the room. Oh, Steve Packen, uh, the, the TV host, the TV Ontario host. He got it. Marcia Ryu, who, who uh, started the, disability policy study at York University. She got used to run the National Institute uh, 
on disability. She got it. Um, I'm sure some other names will come to me. Yeah, I mean, for people from, you know, business people got it, um, academics, you know, got it. And then um, grassroots community organizers like my wife and I got it as well. <laughs> That's definitely cool. I couldn't imagine just what it means. Like, it, it's a very emotional award too, I, I could imagine. And it's, it's it, well, congratulations from from uh, me to you for sure, Al. That's uh, that's really cool. And so th- this is another thing. I really wanted to touch on this because I feel like this is not being talked about a month, uh, enough. Sorry. Um, so obviously, as I said, during the last 11 months, it's been it's been very hard for everyone, but especially those with disabilities. And we were kind of left on the back burner. And just to start off, I'm sure you're not happy about it, but what were your thoughts about Canada only doing a one-time payment of $600 for relief for the disabled community? Um, it's, it was negligence. It's pure negligence. Um, yeah, it was, it's too little and it was way too late. I mean, it arrived at the end of October, um, when we were already into the second wave, when all of the extra expenses that people with disabilities had to deal with were happening, what, six months previously, seven months previously? Um, It wasn't for lack of really strong, clear, valid arguments with documentation and lots of examples. All of that was on the table. I know that. Frankly, I mean, the reason I know that is I was co-chairing the COVID Disability Advisory Committee for the first three months or four months of the pandemic. And, um, And I'm pretty confident the minister was in there fighting. And so it gives you an example of how hard it is to get something through. Um, And in a a way, I feel like the commitment in the throne speech in September to establish Canadian disability benefit is an attempt to atone for what didn't happen, which is why I think we need to really get everyone together to make sure it happens and is significant. And it's not just a one-time 600, but that it's a top-off that amounts to a sizable amount, uh, you know, in the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars every month. That's what we're looking for. Not just during the pandemic, but forever. Definitely. And I think, thank you for your, your dedication to that because it's just, it's sad. It really is. And what do you think, like, obviously this isn't easy to answer, but what, what do you think are some things they could have done differently, the federal government to better support us? Um, well, it would have been nice to have had a COVID disability emergency plan. Um, one got established really, really quickly, like within a month in Australia. Uh, we don't have one yet. So that would have been good. It would have been able to deal with such things as uh, access to PPEs, personal protective equipment and, and everything associated with that. Um, took an awfully long time just to get, for example, a mask that had a transparent front that, you know, so that you could read somebody's lips. Um, I'd like, I wish they would have taken a stronger stand on this whole question of the role of families and loved ones in supporting somebody with a disability who had to go into hospital. You know, I had two things I had to deal with personally around that in my own family. Um, and it is unfair and inaccurate to not recognize the authority and indispensability of a husband, a wife, um, a parent, a close friend, a loved one to be with somebody with a disability inside a hospital environment and not recognize those people as an essential part of the care team. We managed to get a policy on that uh, at the federal level, but it never really 
was led by the federal government to encourage provinces to do that. So those are some of the areas that I think, I, I mean, I won't even talk right now about long-term care. There are, you know, I don't know if you've had him on your show yet, uh, Jonathan Marchand, you know, he's one of 12,000 Canadians with disabilities who are living in long-term care facilities, but they're not elderly. Jonathan, uh, in the summer, uh, chained himself to the legislature in Quebec built an iron cage for himself and chained himself there. So, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot that we could have had in place and still don't have in place, um, which is why I think we need to not just package a solution to something, Clayton, and hand it to government and say, okay, you take it from here and we'll monitor you. I think we have to actually design the solution and walk roll through every single part of the process and shadow every aspect of it. In, a, in, a, in effect, act as the orchestra conductor, even though nobody's given us that job. So. Definitely, and my, Jonathan has not been on the show yet, but he is on my radar. I saw that okay. story and I was very intrigued and trying to get a hold of him. I'm not sure exactly how, but I'm sure I'll figure it out. Well, I always I, do. I can give you his, I can put you in touch with him and he's fluently bilingual. So he's very articulate. In fact, he presented at the C, Bill C-7 hearings in the Senate um, recently, um, you know, protesting the, the attempt by this government to expand uh, uh, made um, and include disability as grounds by itself for eligibility for medical aid and dying without any consideration for the lack of supports in somebody's life. Definitely. And I think to change it, we might, we might need a Judy human moment where we storm the cat, like not obviously not insurrectionist type style, but just allow our voices to be heard and, and get in there and, and advocate as much as we can for it. Like it, it, it does have to change. I agree with you. And I'm, I hope I hope we we figure it out soon. But thank you for your insight there. That's that's greatly appreciated. That's that's great. And and just to, to wrap up, I again, it's you can say so much. But moving forward, how do you think we can continue to support the disabled community and especially for non-disabled people? Um. Well, let me let me put it in some in real practical terms. I, I'd like to see a half billion dollar fund available for disabled people to use to address systemic discrimination against disabled people. Systemic discrimination against against uh, exists against indigenous people, against people of color. We know that uh, it's time to put some resources uh, on the table. So, I'd like to see a shift and who controls those funds, i.e. people with disabilities. Um, so that that's one maybe seen to be small on one level, but I think it could trigger a, an awful lot. Uh, I do not think we have uh, in our government apparatus um, a proper commitment to accessibility and a, and a really genuine understanding of nothing about us without us. So um, we should be having deputy ministers who have a disability. We, so we need a full court advancement of people with disabilities into the infrastructure of society. Um, you know, Carolyn Casey, who you mentioned is also a friend of mine and um, she's taken it to a whole other level. I, I mean, she says, I, I don't know if you've seen her film a short two minute called diverse ish. It's brilliant. It's so funny. And it makes the point that the inclusion and diversity agenda has excluded people with disabilities. So Carolyn says she wants a decade of disruption. Another disability activist I admire in the United States uh, says that we want to move from inclusion to infiltration. So, um, so this diversity inclusion agenda isn't working. So if you're an ally of somebody with a disability, I, I think we need to step back as I'm trying to do with the Canadian Disability 
benefit, step right into the background, offer my skills, what I've learned, and put it at the surface of dis service of disability led initiatives. Finally, forever. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I, I agree wholeheartedly. And, and while well, Al, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate your time and, and your answers. And I, I look forward to keeping in touch. I, uh, I'm, I'm honored I met you and I hope, I hope you're uh, happy you met me too, because it's, it's definitely cool to connect and I really do appreciate it. Well, I'm happy to connect with you and to have met you and I, I hope we can stay in touch. Uh, we could use your support for the Canadian Disability Benefit um, as a communicator uh, at the very least. And when you decide to run for political office, let me know, I'll, I'll sign up to help you. Awesome, well, thank you very much, <laughs> Al. I appreciate it and I will, definitely send a link to you when it's posted. It should be out on Friday at noon, my time. So 9am for you. Okay. All the best. Yeah, you too. I'll take care and stay safe. Bye-bye.